I now call on Father Michael to lead us in prayer. So we just say a little prayer for uh, Michael and for all who are at risk in this cemetery. And we think of his family at the time, and he was only 27 years of age. And we think of the, the loss that he was at that time to, to, to his family and especially. We're gathered here in a small group, just like the co Michael Kennedy's comrades gathered on that day many, many years ago, when the lady's mortal remains to rest here on the banks of the Shannon. But this was one of the largest and best planned events involving over 200 volunteers and many weeks of planning. His comrades brought him here um, secretly and he was buried in the grave of some relatives because at the time, it was impossible to bury a volunteer publicly. Claudia Kennedy, or Kennedy, will now lay a wreath on behalf of his family in memory of his uncle Michael. John Connors will lay a wreath representing Tipperary in the Decade of Revolution group. Maria Hogan from Kilbarntary Das Historical Society will lay a bouquet of flowers that grow locally to represent the community of Kilbarntary Das where Michael of Kennedy's ancestors came from. Now observe a minute silence represented Michael of Kennedy, all that have died during this decade of revolution and all that, those who lie silent in this graveyard. Uh, that was just a piece of video footage um, put together by uh, Michael Malampi of Coolbawn Cross Photography um, for the occasion of the wreath laying ceremony, uh, which we had just um, a couple of weeks back. And it also incorporated some photographs from the Brendan Tracy archive of the um, unveiling of the headstone, um, which was commissioned by Michael Kennedy's comrades back in 1971, um, just to, um, just after the 50th anniversary of his death, and we'll be looking at that um, later in the in the course of the talk. But I, I think Michael did a beautiful job on it, and it kind of captured the essence of what happened that day, and I suppose both days really. Um, I mean. The picture there of Michael's comrades actually coming into Kilbarn um, graveyard, I think it was a very evocative um, look at what happened that day, um, just under 50 years ago now. Uh, the attack on Borsicane Barracks was actually, uh, I suppose it marked the turning point really in the, tip, in the War of Independence in Tipperary. Um, prior to that, you had had uh, sporadic attacks on um, either small groups of policemen um, or we'd say tit for tat actions um, by what, what they termed themselves as the anti murder gang. And coming into 1920, uh, things took a, in, in terms of violence, things took a, a severe turn for the worse. Um, and the whole um, tempo of things started to heat up. And this was, to a large extent, brought about by the, the rescue of Sean Hogan at Knock Long and the, invest, the subsequent investigations of that. Um, I mean, you're all probably familiar with the, we'd say that Salahed Beg was the first action of the 
um, the War of Independence and transpiring from that, you got the arrest of Sean Hogan and the determined effort by his comrades that he was not going to be transported to Cork and to, to stand trial and possible execution. <clears throat> the, the rescue of Hogan from the train at Knocklong led to the deaths of two policemen and the subsequent investigation, uh, which was being led by this, uh, District Inspector Michael Hunt. Um, Hunt, Hunt was pretty determined um, and he, he was also a figure that would say was pretty much disliked um, because of previous events that had taken place in County Tipperary and uh, because of the intensity of his investigation, uh, volunteers decided that he was going to be got, got rid of. And that happened in um, June in the square in Turles in 1919. Um, on foot of that, the uh, RIC in Tipperary decided that they were not going to let um, IRA volunteers um, murder their colleagues with impunity. And they, they set up what was pretty much termed as the anti-murder gang. And they began to systematically assassinate known um, IRA members. And this led to a, a kind of a, pretty much, if you like, the kettle boiling over um, in terms of action. Um, but as I said, these were all kind of isolated individual actions. Um, but they spread right across um, North Tipperary from Turles to Laura. Um, these events were pretty much occurring. Um, when we look at the planning of the, the actual attack on Borsigian Barracks, um, the planning of the attack was um, put together by brigade staff led by Sean Gaynor of Nina. And there were actually several weeks of planning involved in it. First of all, there was the selection of the target. Would it be Rare Cross or Boris Akean? Um, both uh, barracks were being examined um, in terms of location. Uh, they were both pretty sizable barracks. Uh, both were in relatively isolation, um, isolated locations in terms of assistance um, from other barracks. Um, the, also, there was the logistics in relation to the attack. Uh, the, the method devised for attacks on barracks at this stage was to literally break an opening in the barracks, feed fuel through that opening, um, also put explosives into the, the mix in terms of either gel ignite, grenades, whatever was available, um, sustained gunfire on the barracks, and would say to keep the the garrison in the barracks busy um, while the, the barrack was being set alight through the use of the fuel and explosives. So fuel, explosives, guns and ammunition all had to be procured in sufficient quantities to press home an attack. Also um, being looked at was the manpower required um, both to contribute to the attack itself and also to um, provide the various support structures involved. <coughs> Excuse me. What also uh, needed to be looked at was a uh, route for the arrival and departure of those um, involved in the attack. Now, the map here shows us the location of Borisakian um, in relation to other barracks. Uh, we have Borisakian um, here in the, the center of the map. And you can see the other outposts that are surrounding it. You'd need it to the, the south, um, Portumna to the north, and um, also Bor, uh, where you had both military and police, and you'd Ross Grey to the east. Now, with the selection of Boris Akane, it became necessary to make sure that once the attack commenced and the, the barrack began to seek assistance through launching Vera flares or um, attempting to phone out, out the other barracks that no aid would be possible to get into the area and surprise the volunteers. So this, this meant that all the surrounding eight roads um, needed to be um, cut off. 
and that, that's what these uh, actors are marking. Now, Austin McCurtain was the intelligence officer for the uh, number one um, Tipperary Brigade. Um, he was based in Nina, and he was appraised of the arrival of a large consignment of petrol at Nina Railway Station. He had alerted the local volunteers and procured a lorry. Uh, Michael Gaynor and volunteer Joe Stair um, were assigned to remove the fuel, and they did so with the assistance of staff from the railway station. Now, the fuel was transported to Moneygall and hidden in the local sandpit. However, somehow or other, the RIC in Moneygall got a were made aware of the fact that the fuel stolen from the Nina railway station had been hidden locally. Um, but their attempts to recover the fuel uh, were, was countermanded really by Money Gall Company, who preempted the search of the sandpit and managed to remove the, um, the petrol uh, prior to the arrival of the RIC. Um, so it, it was actually moved to another um, quarry location where it was concealed, um, awaiting the decision for the date of the attack. Now, the attack itself, <coughs> um, the attack was scheduled for 12 midnight on Saturday, 26th of June, 1920. Um, in the me in meantime, Frank McGrath, who was the um, brigadier for, commandeer, was the commandant in charge of the brigade area, was released from jail and arrived home and he decided to take charge of the operation on the night. Um, over 200 volunteers from the North Tipperary and Offaly Brigades were actually assembled um, and alerted to take part in the actual attack on the night. Um, Ned O'Leary of the, the Nina um, company spent two, two weeks selecting trees that would, needed to be felled um, in order to block the roads. Uh, these trees were marked and some of them were partially so untrue. Now, most involved in the attack were actually involved in the transport of petrol um, and guns and tree felling, road trenching and wall, wall building. Um, this is pretty much what the volunteers on the night would have actually seen um, when they approached the barrack. Uh, the barrack today is the Garda Barracks in Borussikian. Um, back then, I say it was manned by RIC and stoutly defended. Uh, all the windows um, on the ground and first floors um, were protected with steel shuttering. And these shutters had um, gun loops in them. I have one with showing light here behind it, which would have been the day room in the barrack um, where the, the, the police on duty would have been stationed. Uh, the front of the barrack was defended with uh, barbed wire entanglements. So this is pretty much the view that the uh, volunteers would have had that night as they arrived in Boris Akean. Now at 10 p.m. Uh, Clock Jordan, Boris Akean, Tumivara and Nina companies reached the assembly point, uh, which was at Bally Nevin Quarry. Uh, that's on the Clock Jordan side of Boris Akean. Uh, close to Crotta or Nisbet's Bridge, uh, approximately a mile outside Borsakian. At 11 o'clock, they moved out and commenced the march on Borsakian uh, to take up their positions. <clears throat> now, here we see a map of, the, of Borsakian, and at the top here, we have the, the barracks uh, located. Uh, down here at the very bottom, you'll see the, the quarry near Crotta Bridge, uh, which was the assembly point. And the green line here marks the route um, taken by the volunteers. Just on the outskirts of Borsakane, they split into two. Uh, one group going across the fields here um, and taking a position here in buildings to the rear of the barrack. Uh, this was mainly comprised of men of the, of the Tumivara company. Uh, the remainder of the men proceeded down the, the main street and divided in two here. Um, some of them taken over uh, the house adjoining the barracks, which was owned by the Brennan family. And the remainder of the men 
uh, under Liam Hoolan, uh, taking up three buildings here, a uh, local convent school and two shops. One was a jeweler's and the other was a saddler's. Uh, they took over the first floors of both of those three buildings um, from where to commence firing on the, the barrack. Now, one road had been left clear um, when the, the roads were being blocked, and this was the Kilbarren Road out of uh, Borussia this road here. This was the line of retreat for the, the men attacking. <coughs> uh, on the stroke of midnight, um, a whistle was sounded by um, Frank McGrath, who had actually set up his headquarters here in Brennan's house. And he was accompanied in the house at the time by men who were assigned to break out onto the roof of Brennan, through the roof of Brennan's, climb onto the roof of the barracks and break through the roof of the barracks. Uh, in the yard at Brennan's and in the laneway beside the house uh, there were up to 60 men located whose job was to fill petrol into bottles um, from the cans um, which, which it had been transported to Bursacane in and to basically form a human chain um, passing the, the petrol from the, we'll say the petrol bomb assembly point in the yard um, right along through the house, through Brennan's house and up onto the roof uh, to the men engaged in breaking through the roof of the barrack. Once the whistle was sounded, uh, Liam Hoolan instructed the men located here to commence firing on the barrack and the, the men located at the rear of the barrack also commenced fire. Now, there was approximately 60 men engaged in, we'll say, the, the petrol line, and there were three sections of rifle and shotgun men um, located opposite and to the rear. As I said, said Brennan's house adjoining the barracks was basically the front line um, of the staging post on the barrack, and the men here were armed with revolvers and grenades. The roof of Brennan's house was broken through and slates removed on the barrack roof. And the men on the roof began to throw petrol bombs and burning turf into the roof space of the barrack. Fire started almost immediately, but the, the garrison made no show at all of surrendering. Just over two hours into the attack, um, Frank McGrath decided he was actually going to abort the attack. However, um, Sean Gaynor convinced him to press home the attack for at least another hour. At 3.15 a.m., McGrath gave the order again to withdraw. Now, Gaynor at this stage was furious, and he was press pressing for a continuation as the attack was actually burning at this stage. Sorry, the barrack was actually burning at this stage. McGrath refused, and the attack was aborted. <clears throat> now, the attackers withdrew along the pre-planned route through Kilvarn, Cohen, and Ballycommon, um, where, from which point they actually dispersed to their own um, locations, Ballywillam, um, Nina, Tumivara, Silver Mines, uh, Ross Gray, wherever. Um, approximately half an hour later, the police were actually forced to evacuate the barracks. Um, they immediately took over the convent school, which had been, we we'll say, in use by the volunteers. Um, they took over that as a temporary premises. Now, if we look at who, who was actually in the barrack on the night, um, there were 16 men stationed in Bursacane barracks at the time of the attack. Most of these lived in the barracks um, unless they were gone home on leave. Uh, the garrison consisted of one head constable, two sergeants, and 13 constables. And one of those sergeants were, was allocated the role of defensive barracks. Um, in the event of the attack, as happened here, um, he would actually, regardless of his rank, he would actually have taken over the defensive duties um, and he would have had total charge of the barracks uh, for the duration of the attack. Now, if we look at who, who was actually present in the barrack, um, head constable was John Minahan. Uh, sergeant Willem Lorden was actually the defensive barracks sergeant and the duty sergeant was Sergeant Thomas Halloran. Uh, constables were F.C. Byerley, Thomas Carson, Henry Chappell, uh, John Dynan, Trevanian C. Fallon, Patrick Jordan, uh, Willem Keller, uh, Thomas F. Bourne, 
John F. Crump, uh, Fred R. E. Curry, Thomas Donnelly, Martin Feeney, and Philip Kiernan. Now, some of those men had only actually arrived in Bursacain uh, two months early, earlier, um, having been posted there around the 27th of April. Um, so it, it was actually a, a bit of a, a warm welcome, shall we say, for them into Tipperary and particularly Bursacain. Um, following the it would say the, burn, the, the barracks actually went on fire, as I said, and was rendered unusable. Um, the, initially, the, the RSC took over the convent school, but subsequent to that, they moved for, just further up the street there, on the main street, um, took over a, a family house. And here you see that just a couple of months after the attack, um, again, you can see, see some of the steel shutters here and the loopholes actually in them. Um, the shutters were actually in two halves. Uh, they could be extended up over the full window um, or during daylight hours, they, they could be folded over um, as, as they are here in the upper floors. The, the ground floor, they're still completely shuttered. And here, here you can see three of the policemen and another one here at the top window. Uh, you'll also notice the barbed wire entanglements here, here on the, the front of the barrack. And here we have a photograph of uh, the, the garrison, which would say was in Bursa uh, This would have been around November of uh, 1920, um, after the arrival of uh, further seven men, uh, one of whom was Robert Crossett, who I mentioned before the, the talk started. Uh, that's Robert Crossett just here on the left. Um, he, he was one of the, the black and tans that ar arrived in Bursa Cain. Um, sorry, I seem to be getting some feedback there from another microphone. Yeah, I'm hearing it too, um, John. I'm checking everyone's on mute. I can't find anyone that who's not muted. So if they continue on, maybe. Okay. And we'll see, does it continue? Now, if we look at the aftermath of the attack, um, in, in the aftermath of the attack, there were changes in the IRA command structure in North Tipperary. Uh, despite the meticulous planning that had gone into place in, in relation to the attack, uh, the attackers failed to take the barracks, and this was a, a source of concern for them. Um, the object of the um, attack had been to take, in addition to rendering the barrack um, unusable, it had been the desire to actually take the barrack, capture arms and ammunition, which were sorely needed for equipping uh, volunteers in the Tipperary area. Um, again, there was a similar result some weeks later in the attack on rear cross barracks, which is the the second barrack attack in North Tipperary. Uh, in the wake of the attack, the Bursa Cain complement of RIC was strengthened by the addition of seven member, new members in November 1920. And the attack also led to the death of volunteer Michael Kennedy, um, which we'll take a look at now. Uh, Michael Kennedy was born on 12th of September 1892 at Bank Place in Nina. He was the second son of Edward Kennedy and Julia Toohey. Uh, Julia Toohey was uh, originally from um, Cameron, uh, which was an island actually located on the Shannon, uh, just out from uh, Kilbarn. And she had moved to, to Nina, um, where she had actually uh, had a public house premises in Bank Place. Now, Michael, too, uh, uh, Michael Kennedy, who you see here in a Nina Institute hurling team, standing there in the, the back road, second from the left, uh, he, he, he actually hurled with Nina Institute, um, quite well known in the Nina community, um, and both as a hurler and for working within the family business. 
Now he joined the British Army around 1915, and he was he served in both Gallipoli and in France. Um, he was a member of the Royal Irish Regiment, and you see him here in the uniform of the Royal Irish Regiment. Um, and he was demobilised in March 1919, and when which, at which point he returned to Nina. <clears throat> now, when he returned, he found that two, his two brothers, um, Edward, his older brother, and Paddy, his younger brother, um, were both members of the IRA. Following their example, he himself joined in August 1919. Uh, he acted as both a drill and musketry instructor for the 1st Battalion. And he was in the front line, basically Brennan's house in Borussia Now, when one of the volunteers working on the roof um, received burns to his arm, uh, when some petrol spilt on top of him, um, Michael Kennedy immediately volunteered to take his place on the roof. Shortly after uh, commencing work, um, pouring petrol through the roof opening, he received a bullet wound in his thigh. Um, he was evacuated to Dr. Quigley's house for treatment. Um, and subsequent to the attack, he was removed to Slattery's Pub in Valley Common, where um, after the attack had been aborted. Now, um, when he was brought to Slattery's in Valley Common, uh, Andy Coney, who was pretty well known um, for his involvement in subsequently in IRA activity, um, so he later became the chief of staff of the IRA. He actually cycled from Valley Common to Nina uh, to get medical assistance in the form of uh, Dr. A.D. or Louis Courtney. <clears throat> um, when Dr. Courtney came to Valley Common and assessed uh, Michael Kennedy's condition, he immediately determined that Kennedy needed to be hospitalized and he decided that he, he'd convey him to St. John's Hospital in Limerick. Uh, Dr. Courtney returned to, uh, Saint, to Nina Hospital or Nina Workhouse and he got two of the nuns, um, Sisters of Mercy, from the hospital to come back to Valley Common with him. Um, and he decided he'd drive him himself with him in the company of the two nuns, uh, hoping that their presence in the car might deter the military um, from making too serious a search. Um, because he knew at this stage there would be bound to be checkpoints. Uh, leaving Valley Common, they proceeded by way of Monsey, Newtown, Portru, Balnea, Killaloo, and in kind of like the back road into, into Limerick from where they went to St. John's Hospital. Along the way, they were actually stopped on three, at three different points. Once at Newtown, um, again at Portru, and again on the bridge in Killaloo. <coughs> um, and to prevent um, Michael Kennedy drawing attention, um, Courtney had actually refrained from giving him any morphine. So Michael Kennedy was actually in severe pain the whole way uh, during the, this journey. Um, which he he managed to let's say carry himself pretty well, um, and they, they managed to talk their way through the the checkpoints at each of the the three points. Um, they were stopped without any great difficulty. Now he was admitted to St John's Hospital under the name of Michael Gleason, um, where he was described on the admissions register as being a labourer um, from Ennis. Um, however, despite the best efforts of Surgeon Roberts and staff in the hospital, he actually contracted sepsis and he succumbed to his injury on the 23rd of July 1920. Now here we see the death cert um, for Michael Gleason as he, he was listed. Um, he's described as being a bachelor, 29 years of age, um, a labourer, Um, it says he was wounded, sorry, wounded in the thigh, um, and septicemia was the cause of his death certified. Um, it's a, signed by Manager Hayes, the occupier of St. John's Hospital, and it's uh, listed as July the, the, the 23rd, uh, 1920. Now, um, if, if it became known in Nina that Michael Kennedy was actually, in, would say, after dying as a result of the Borsican attack, 
Um, the family home would probably have been burned um, and possibly other premises connected with some of the Nina volunteers could also have ended up in flames. So um, the funeral took place in secret uh, with just a, a few of his comrades um, opening a, a grave in um, the old cemetery in Kilbarn, which had actually been used some months previously for the burial of a family relative. Um, one of the two he's had been buried in that grave. <coughs> um, Michael Kennedy was the first North Tipperary volunteer to die in action. He wasn't the first volunteer to be killed, but he was, he was actually the first one to die, we'll say, in military action. Um, and a headstone commemorating him was erected by surviving comrades in 1971. The occasion of that unveiling at the headstone um, was very much a, a healing of old wounds and it saw the coming together of would say, comrades from both sides of the Civil War divide. And if we look at some of the photographs from that day, um, here we have uh, General Michael Joe Costello, um, a native of Clock Jordan, uh, with, who was um, a member of the Free State Army during the Civil War. Um, he was actually, he, he, he's pictured here actually delivering the oration at, um, at the unveiling of the headstone. Uh, the erection of the headstone was actually organised by Michael Gaynor, who um, he'd been on the anti-treaty side during the Civil War. And here you see um, Michael Kennedy's comrades um, from both sides, say, of that divide, uh, marching into Kilburn on, on that Sunday uh, back in 1971. Uh, some of you may recognize some of the, the faces of in that crowd. And here we see Con Spain, um, who um, was, was a, a member of the, the number one brigade, um, unveiling the headstone on Michael Kennedy's grave um, back then. Now, Michael Kennedy was posthumously awarded the War of Independence Participants Medal. Um, here we see the, see the the front and reverse of the medal with his name actually inscribed. And he had also received uh, two World War I service medals, uh, the British Army Service Medal and the Victory Medal, the Allied Victory Medal. Um, unfortunately, ribbons belong to the medal. None of the medals have actually survived. Now, if we look at the, the attack, um, the attack actually demonstrated that the IRA had the ability, the resources, and the manpower, A, to isolate a barracks, and B, to pursue an attack on the barracks. Um, the attack also exposed tensions within the IRA command structure in North Tipperary, um, particularly between Frank McGrath and Sean Gaynor. Gaynor believed that McGrath had withdrawn prematurely and should have actually pressed home the attack um, and he was furious when he when he actually found out that the the police had actually uh, evacuated the barracks less than an hour after they had withdrawn. Now he also claimed that McGrath was influenced while imprisoned by men who were, we'll say, anti physical force. Uh, Gaynor resigned. He tendered his resignation to IRA headquarters in Dublin as brigade adjutant. <coughs> um, However, a reshuffle within the brigade was actually ordered by headquarters and Gaynor was appointed uh, brigade commandant, um, replacing Frank McGrath. Um, vice commandant being uh, named as Liam Hoolan and the adjutant for the um, brigade as Ned O'Leary. Now, Frank McGrath was appointed um, in charge of Republican courts and police in the area. Um, the change in command structure was probably more effective due to the respective strengths of both men. Like Frank McGrath would have been seen as an excellent administrator and really the, would say administering the court system and charge of the, the police was actually an ideal role for him. Um, he wouldn't have had the same, um, as I would say, strength of conviction and um, ruthlessness 
that uh, Sean Gannon would have actually displayed. Um, however, he, he was a, an excellent chief of police and he, he administered that role without fear or favour um, but say in his investigation of crime in the, the Tipperary, in the North Tipperary region uh, during the period of the Republic of Ports. And he didn't hesitate to charge even members of the IRA with crimes um, where he felt the need arose. Uh, Sean Gaynor would have been much more militant in outlook. And he possessed, I suppose, a degree of steel and ruthlessness um, needed for any commander in the field um, to would say, see, see through the, the work that he deemed necessary. I mean, uh, some months later, he didn't hesitate to order the execution of two RIC men, two young, very young RIC men that were actually captured by the brigade um, at least funny. Um, he also was involved um, in the Mudrini ambush, which saw action against uh, the Versaquian garrison again uh, some months later. Um, the loss of Michael Kennedy, I would say, was a pretty severe loss to the brigade area. Um, he was one of very few with formal military training. He had, he had spent three years in the British Army in some of the, the main hotspots, we'll say World War I, Gallipoli um, and the French Front, uh, where he intense experience under fire. Um, we, we see from the way he volunteered to go onto the roof in uh, Worsikane that he had undoubted qualities of both leadership and courage. And I feel myself that he possibly would have been a very effective had he been had he survived and been put in charge of the active service unit or the flying column. <clears throat> uh, Jack Collison and Ned O'Leary, who both held that role at various points, were pretty pretty good flying column men and effective leaders. But I, I think that Kennedy could have possibly brought even an added dimension to the, the role of flying column um, commander, um, having had that, we we'll say, bit of intense military um, training and the fact that he'd, we we'll say, seen war in two different theatres, both in France and in Gallipoli. Um, I, I, I think that had we seen him in, in charge of the, the column, he could have been possibly even more effective and had, had, had even more success than they, they did actually enjoy. Uh, here we see just a photograph of the grave following the retling um, that Sunday there, uh, what's the three Sundays ago now. Um, the, our, our, the talk tonight was made possible because of sponsorship, both Kilburn and Terry Glass Historical Society and ourselves in Tipperary in the decade of revolution uh, received from Tipperary North County Council. And that, that sponsorship in, terms, in turn comes through the Department of Culture, Health, Heritage and the Act. And with, without the money that uh, both of those groups actually make available, it would be very, very difficult for ourselves in Tipperary in the decade of revolution and to learn Terry Glass Historical Society to actually can, we'll say, can run a lot of the events that we, we do actually run. Um, I'd like at this stage also to pay tribute um, on behalf of both our groups and to acknowledge the, fam the Kennedy family um, both in organising the commemoration Kilburn Old Graveyard and for sharing the some of the material uh, used in producing tonight's talk. <coughs> um, if any of you have comments or anything, I'd love to take them, let's say, take them on now at this stage and maybe have a bit of a discussion in in relation to the, the attack and that period in general. Uh, firstly, John, I just want to come in there and just say uh, to thank you. And now I have to unmute myself because the phone has gone off in the background. <laughs> uh, 
Helen, I might just come by while you do that. Um, John, a question is coming there from Mary Alice Phillips. I think that's the lady in Vermont. I'm not sure, maybe I'm wrong. Say, um, the attack was well into the war and still the barracks seemed well staffed. Did mass resignations occur at some point or did the RIC remain vital all during the struggle? Um, there would have been a lot of resignations from the RIC around 1918, um, would say, when, the, when conscription was threatened. And with the commencement of attacks on the RIC in 1919, um, certainly there was no new recruits coming into the RIC. Um, that, and it was that, that actually necessitated the setting up of the, the Black and Tans and the auxiliaries. Um, the, I mean, rec recruitment had literally ceased. Uh, th there were a few uh, sporadic uh, recruitments taking place on the island of Ireland, but nothing like what would have been taking place three, four years, or even two years uh, previously. Um, so hence, hence they felt the need to recruit in England among the, would say, ex-soldiers um, and the officer class. Uh, but in an attempt to get tough with the IRA and to supplement the number, the declining numbers um, within the country, was it brought about by the resignations that the RSC had suffered from and the lack of new blood coming in. Okay. Um, Helen is still on the phone there. Uh, does that, if anyone else has a question or a comment, if you want to unmute yourself, just feel free. We'll take one at a time. John? Yes, Tom, yeah. Um, in total, there were 10,000 black and tans. Um, they started coming in numbers in March 1920, but the first uh, pilot group were brought in in January 1920. But overall, about 10,000 black and tans. Um, now, the irony is they were still recruiting after the treaty. The last black and tan uh, would have been hired at the end of of December 1921, after the treaty. Interesting, Tom. Um, you would have thought that once the, the treaty negotiations commenced that recruitment would have ceased. Um, it's interesting to see that we we'll say the British were pretty much um, laying the, the foundations for the, the war to continue if necessary. There's a quick comment from John Connors as yeah. well there. Sorry. Sorry, Tom, do you want to come back there? Um, the, as I say, the one thing I will say about the latest recruits to the Black and Tans. Now, you hear this thing about they were on 50 or uh, 10 shillings a day and they were temporary recruits. Now, the fellas hired late on in time were all temporary recruits. Uh, but they were on the same money as the, um, uh, the standard RIC men. I think it's there was no difference. John Connor has also made a comment there, uh, John, about one of the defending, one of those defending the garrison, Martin Feeney, was later killed at Madrini. That's right, yeah. Um, we, we might maybe just go back there to the... Um, yeah, Martin Feeney was, I think, a native of Roscommon, or up, up, he was up the Midlands anyway. Um, and he actually tipped off the, he was feeding information to the IRA, and he, he tipped off one of the IRA scouts that the, the, the local gar garrison in um, West Cain would be heading to court in. At Top Jordan um, on the day of the ambush. And unfortunately, um, Feeney actually paid for his life, paid, paid with that for it was his life on the day. And again, it was like he, it was a particularly um, dark aspect of the, the Mother Any ambush. 
in that Feeney managed to escape from the, the, the immediate ambush site and he took refuge in a nearby house. <clears throat> now, um, members of the, the direct members of the column would have known that Feeney was feeding them information. However, uh, some of the, uh, the other IRA people brought in for, in support on the, the day of the ambush would not have been aware that, of, of Feeney's role in this. And he was observed, let's say, fleeing the ambush site and going into the house. And he was followed by some of those men, not aware that he, he was the, the source of the information. Um, in the house, he had actually hidden in one of the bedrooms um, under the bed. And he was dragged out from under the bed, uh, taken out to the side of the house and actually thrown on top of the dung heap um, at the side of the house where he was shot dead. And as he lay dying on, on the dung heap, um, the, the, the men who had shot him uh, took the boots off him and left. Uh, another of the, the men killed in the Mudderney ambush was actually one of the, the seven men that I mentioned who had arrived in November um, in Bursa Cain. Um, he was the Constable Briggs and he was, I think, Renfrewshire in Scotland, he was from. John, um, um, he Helen was there. Helen, you have, you have someone yeah. with Noreen Kennedy on the phone there. Yeah, John, I have, I have Noreen Kennedy here on the phone, who is a niece of Michael. And I'm just going to put Noreen on speaker here in a minute. And she just wants to say a few things to us. Uh, so just one minute, Noreen, now. Hello, Noreen, you're on, you're on speaker now. Is, is that going to be... Hello. This is Noreen O'Kennedy here. And I want to thank you very specially for this marvellous programme about my uncle. But now I have a few little things to add to the story. First of all, the medals were found last week in Bank Place, out in a back, what we used to call the Turf House. And they're in the possession now of Body of Kennedy. You only got them last week. So now that's one little bit. The other bit was, I spent a few years in the convent in Mina. And I knew there a sister, Elizabeth Maxwell. She was the nun, or one of the nuns, that Louis Courtney brought with him to the hospital in St. John. And she used to speak to me about my uncle Mick. But she said very little, just that she went in with him. And the other thing that wasn't mentioned was they say that Michael O'Kennedy's mother could never let on that was her son and that she sat on a chair at the end of Bank Place as the funeral passed down what we would then know as Pound Street as her son was being transported off or to be buried. So listen, thank you. these are just little sides to the story. Thank you very much. But the medals have been found, and we well, I haven't seen them now, but I heard about them from Pawdy last week. So thank you very much for a most informative program, and I certainly will have to get copies of it for all the rest of the O'Kennedys, who were not as lucky as me, because Jerry Flynn did it all for me. Thanks very much, and a great job. Okay. Noreen, thank you very much, and it is actually a privilege and again, um, I think it's, it's working with the likes of John and that, that has made this possible. But it's also the fact that the family has been so helpful. And just looking at the photo of where uh, Michael is laid to rest, he's looking out over Loch Derg. And I think it's, um, it's, it's just as feedback there somewhere. Yeah, the phone's still on. Yeah. Um, just to, to thank you, Noreen, and it is a privilege to have you join us here today. John, you might like to take over from here. Sorry, John, would you like to come back in here, John Flannery? Niall, is that working? I don't know. John, can you hear Helen speaking there? No, he had headphones in, so maybe he's, maybe he's taking them out. Um, so. Hello, John, can you hear us? Yes. I can hear you now, yeah. 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 No, just if, if you just wanted to come in there now, Noreen, just 
it was great for Noreen to join us and, and thanks to Jerry as well for setting that up. Um, Absolutely. Um, I was delighted to hear Noreen come in and um, I mean, what, what she said about um, Michael Kennedy's mother just watching that funeral, I think that, that was particularly poignant um, to think of it, sitting there at the end of Pound Street with that funeral passing by and unable, like, I mean, it, it just gives you the whole concept of the time really that you know, families couldn't participate in funerals uh, of their loved ones. Uh, you had people buried in, buried secretly in graves. Um, like, we'll say, one of them in particular, Jackie Britt, um, another volunteer that died in the course of the War of Independence. He was a member of the Bloody, the, the Bury team of Bloody Sunday. Uh, Jackie Britt was actually buried in four different graves uh, before he found his final resting place. Um, it just gives you an idea of what, what people suffered at the time. Um, but I'd really like to say a huge thank you to Noreen and to the other members of the Kennedy, particularly Pawdy and the Kennedy family, uh, for, we'll say, the help and assistance that they have given in um, as they sharing the medals, sharing the photographs, mm -hmm. and in participating in the, the retelling um, in Kilbarn. Um, Michael Kennedy was, he was forgotten for too long. Um, like he, he was 50 years in an unmarked grave there in Kilbarn. And it was thanks to these comrades that the headstone we're looking at was erected. And we said the men's contribution um, and martyrdom for Ireland really uh, brought to light. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's all part of who we are and what we are. And part of the whole story that would say bring, brings us around uh, to, to, to today, um, it, it's, it's a huge honour for me to, to be able to work at bringing these stories to light. And um, John Connor, people like John Connors, Tom Toomey, myself, I mean, we, we, we get great pleasure out of uh, just, just bringing those people, those stories alive for for a new generation to actually share them. Because I, I grew up hearing those stories from, let's say, people my, like like my father, um, my granduncle who, who participated in those events, um, and a huge fear is that a lot a lot of this stuff will actually be lost to to future generations if we don't remember it now. Okay, <coughs> John, I was just wondering, is there, sorry, anyone else there that has anything to say? And maybe if there's, if there's any other members of the Kennedy family and relations there, if they would like to say anything, just because, um, uh, just if, if you have, it would, it would be interesting just to, to hear from you if anyone wants to say anything else. Um, just before anyone else comes in, Helen, um, I'd just like to also, also mention, um, in the course of the talk, I mentioned that, excuse me, um, Edward Kennedy and um, Paddy Kennedy, uh, Michael's brothers were also involved in the War of Independence. And I mean, there's huge Borsican uh, connections there in the family. Uh, Paddy Kennedy, uh, himself a survivor of would say, that period, was killed tragically um, at Art Crony on a Sunday afternoon in uh, 1939, uh, while actually cycling with his wife uh, to her brother's home um, in Boris um, he, he was struck by a van and killed instantly. Um, and subsequently, subsequent to that, he was actually buried uh, close by his brother there in Kilbarren. Um, another um, would say a military funeral uh, with his coffin draped into tricolour and his comrades firing uh, three volleys over his grave. Yeah, that, that grave we, we think is just to the left of the grave that you're looking at there. There's two, two headstones there and we're presumed that that's probably where Patrick is buried. Um, and I, I think t today, I suppose, uh, even just looking at the video, um, when you look at the old graveyards, they hold so much history. 
um, stretching back from that, that church is, I think, around 1200, um, right up to the present dates, the, the graveyard is still in use and it holds so much history. Um, and it's it's that history, I suppose, that, that um, I, I think when you look at Michael O'Kennedy as as well as many others, it, it and you see that they're were fighting in, in the First World War um, with the British Army and then the the history that followed after that with the War of Independence, the Civil War, it actually shows the complexity of our of our history. And I think what you're doing, Johnny, it gives us a chance to understand it. Um, that it's not straightforward, none of it is. Um, and just to thank you again, and um, I'll just pass it back to you, John, if you wanted to just um, say another few words. Um, thank you, Hilton. Um, I, say, I said at the outset there, it, it's working with groups like yourself, with say, local history societies, um, that would say allows us to be as effective as I think we actually are um, in bringing these stories to light, particularly bringing them to light within the communities where they actually happened. Um, I mean, it was, it was fantastic to go down to Kilbarn with yourselves there three Sundays ago and lay the wreaths and the flowers there on, on that day um, and to have you host this talk here tonight. Uh, we had an awful lot more planned for this year, but unfortunately, the, the lockdown with the, the COVID-19 uh, restrictions has brought an awful lot of that to a halt. And um, we can only hope that things might improve as the months go on and we can get back to what, what we like doing. And that is, would say, bring those stories alive in the communities um, throughout Tipperary. Um, and on that point, sorry if I interrupt you there, I just wonder would it be useful to ask people now, Helen, how, how they found the whole experience of like watching a talk over Zoom, just briefly, do you want to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down or just yeah, or any comment? Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, because this is our first Zoom talk and um, we hope we won't have too many more, as John says, that we can get back into the halls or out in the fields or wherever. But just, yeah, if people have, have comments of how, how, how they felt the Zoom talk went or what was good, what was bad, I suppose, as well. So yeah, maybe just give a thumbs up if you think it was okay or whatever, you know, just just let us know, I suppose, we, because feedback helps. Hi, Helen and everybody, Project Laughlin here from Dublin, Fox Rock. Uh, thank you very much for letting me partake in this. I, I, I really got into it because I wanted to see a bit more about the mechanism of uh, Zoom talks like this because we plan to do them ourselves. But I found the topic tremendously interesting and I have to congratulate John and everybody concerned on the research and the detail. So it uh, it turned out to be tremendously interesting. I, I couldn't say anything bad about it, but I just want to make one tiny comment because I have kind of interest in the technology. And it's just, just in case if any, you, you didn't know, John, uh, a difficulty with, Zo with Zoom is I think that it runs at about 10 frames a second. And when you're playing any kind of ordinary video through it, you get this kind of stop starting. Um, if you want to avoid that, um, if you get your videos converted to a slower frame rate, uh, they kind of will run smoothly. I, I think they may run smoothly as well if you uh, click on optimize for video. But uh, I was trying to do some stuff myself and I found that. Uh, but you, you only had a tiny piece and, and it, it didn't really matter. And the fact that you see it like that is it's fine. But it's just, I, I've been going through things about Zoom and uh, what's involved in it. So uh, I just share that with you. But it's not a criticism in any sense or form. I enjoy the whole thing tremendously. And for a complete outsider to just get a story like this from an area like that, tremendously interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Parik. Thank you. Appreciate the comments. I, I think, sure. uh, like as Parik said, you know, it's, it's it's the research that goes in there. And as as um, Noreen and John taught me earlier in the week, um, you know, you think you have all the research done, and then someone finds a box of medals in a shed. So there's there's history being found every day. And I suppose maybe we all should look in our attics and sheds because it adds so much to, to the story. Um, John, there's some lovely comments coming in. I'm hoping you that you're, you're, you're seeing them as well uh, from people. Uh, very, very positive. Um, and it's, it's, it's been great to be able to do this tonight. Um, 
so I, I don't know whether you want to finish up, John, or what, uh, probably shortly, because I know Zoom probably only takes our attention for so long, but it's been a fantastic, the hour has gone by, I think, pretty quickly. And it's there's one, yeah. Sorry, Helen, there's one comment here from someone uh, inquiring, when will it be available on YouTube? And I suppose we'll have to look at that, that could take a, a week or so because we have to look at uploading it and maybe having it as a private video where we can just share the link with members or attendees, but you can discuss that over the next few days. Okay. Um, yeah, but I, I'm aware that there's a lot of people that haven't been able to get on here tonight and are hoping that it will be on YouTube. So to be honest, I, I, I would like, like us to make it available as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because really, you know, it's, it's sharing our history is what it's about. And I think the further we can share that, the better. Yeah. yeah. Um, to, to everyone that has put, say, joined us tonight, I'd like to say a huge thank you. And particularly for everyone that's put up comments there. Um, it's, you know, it, it's nice to get a bit of feedback and see what, what we're doing right. And what, what maybe we can do a bit better. Uh, as I said at the outset, maybe when some of you hadn't joined, uh, John Connors and myself are looking at the moment at collecting songs and recitations um, of Tipperary in the War of Independence and uh, Civil War. So if any of you have actually any material relating to that period at all and would be willing to share it with us, um, we'd love to hear from you at John Connors at Tipperary, at, sorry, John Connors at Tipperrevolution.ie or John Flannery at Tipperrevolution.ie. Um, any any songs, recitations, anything at all in, in, in terms of those that you might have. Um, no matter how how common you might think they are um, or how well circulated you might feel they are, send them on anyway. I prefer to get 10 copies of something, then miss one copy. Mm. Um, so again, just a huge thank you for participating and thank you all for the support that you, you give the events that we run. Uh, we'll let you know as soon as the booklet is available and we, we can make arrangements for getting them to you. John, um, just before you finish, um, I'm just looking at the headstone here and I'm just seeing in the corner <coughs> a man lying off in his chair and the reason that that headstone is so straight and erect and still standing is because of the foundation that was put in for the erecting of the headstone back in 1971 by Christy Cormican, who joins us here tonight as well. So Christy, the foundation has, has withstood its, its years. Um, so it's, it's amazing the connection, the small little connections that people have with this story tonight. Okay. So yeah, just to... to and Helen, if I can come in here, just actually, just Bill Ryan just sent a message there asking, would it be possible to um, just run the video at the end again as, as a wrap up? Um, I have it lined up here on YouTube. And if I can, might, that might give us a better quality. Uh, John, if you're okay with that. Yeah, perfect, Niall. That'd be great. So I was, I was we, thinking the same myself, actually. Yeah, I know. I, could, I um, couldn't get you. Sorry, go on. The, 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 actually, the, the very first photograph um, in that video is actually the Bursacane men that took over the barracks in Bursacane in 1922, uh, following the evacuation of the RIC, sorry, 1921, um, February of 1921, uh, following the evacuation of, sorry, February 1922. 22. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah. February 1922, the evacuation of the barrack. Um, they're the local Bursacane men that took over that barrack. Uh, we will have that photograph in the booklet when it comes out, and we actually have all the names uh, to go with it. Okay, so just conscious of the time, so Helen, so if we just show the video, and it, do we consider it all wrapped up at that point? I, I think so, yeah, and just to thank everyone again, and we'll hopefully have another one of these down the line. Okay. And thanks again to John and the Tipperary Decade of Revolution Group. Uh, good night from us all in... Ballanderry, Kilbarn, Terry, Glass, Nina, not forgetting the people who are getting married in Vermont, Peter and Mary, and um, everyone across the water in England as well. Thank you all. And we're going to share the video now. Okay.
I now call on Father Michael to lead us in prayer. So we just say a little prayer for uh, Michael and for all who are made to rest in this cemetery. And we think of his family at the time, and he was only 27 years of age. And we think of the, the loss that he was at that time to, to, to his family, and especially. Gathered here in a small group, just like the, Michael Kennedy's comrades gathered on that day many, many years ago, when the lady's mortal remains to rest here on the banks of the Shannon. But this was one of the largest and best planned events involving over 200 volunteers and many weeks of planning. The comrades brought him here um, secretly and he was buried in the grave of some relatives. Because at the time, it was impossible to bury a volunteer publicly. Audie Kennedy, or Kennedy, will now lay a wreath on behalf of his family in memory of his uncle Michael. John Connors will lay a wreath representing Tipperary in the Decade of Revolution group. Maria Hogan from Kilbarntree Das Historical Society will lay a bouquet of flowers that grow locally to represent the community of Kilbarntree Das where Michael or Kennedy's ancestors came from. Now observe a minute silence represented Michael or Kennedy, all that have died during this decade of revolution and all that those who lie silent in this graveyard. <laughs> 